Hello, friends, and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. We've been telling you for a while that poker is not only a skill, but a superpower. And today we're going to discuss it by discussing the ethics of poker and Ed Norton and Matt Damon and a whole bunch of other great actors in the movie Rounders. All that more after a commercial break with Paul Hoppy, right after this commercial break, that Eddie KGB is probably in control of. Welcome back. I'm Matthew. Use they, them pronouns. I'm your host. I am Paul Hoppy. I live in Las Vegas, and this is going to become <laughs> there <you> relevant. Go. <laughs> Paul, this is one we've been talking about for a really long time, and, and I appreciate it. Today is my birth... Uh, I'm not going to mention that. Yeah, yeah. Um, happy birthday. Mention it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Today is my birthday, uh, and we were talking about what to do. This is an episode we've wanted to do for a while. Um, why, why do you love this movie so much? What, what makes this movie one you were really excited to talk about? I mean, there's two things that make this movie a great movie. One is that it is just clearly, without anything remotely close, the best movie about poker. The best poker movie, right? In terms of the poker in the movie, nothing else I've seen is even remotely close. And number two, it's just, it's a good movie. Like, it's a good indie film, you know, with like, it's a low-budget film with a bunch of great actors and, like, you know, the plot is like, eh, who cares about the plot? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just really good characters and great performances. And it's it's compelling. And it, you know, it, I would say it is as responsible for sort of the poker boom that happened in the early 2000s as, um, as anything else. I think so. Get I think so. Later. Like, watching it, it, and we'll definitely talk about this later, it's funny to see how much poker has changed, but one mm-hmm. thing I remembered is that for those first couple of years after the movie, especially when I was in grad school um, in the early 2000s, um, there was a lot of home games being played. I don't think I ever went to a home game of poker without someone quoting John Malkovich at some point during the game. Like, it was just all the time. Yeah. Um, and I was probably the one quoting it at least 20 to 30% of the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Paul, no, I certainly it, heard some, some of those come out of your mouth on a fairly regular basis. Like, for sure. <laughs> it, it was rough. It was rough. Yeah. But it was also, like, there was this universal language of, like, everyone who played poker had seen the movie. And especially <clears throat> people who were kind of just getting into poker. You know, yeah. I think it really brought a lot of people in. It to me, it brought the people in who then sort of seeded the poker boom, which when we started getting online poker, which was right around this time, and then five years after the movie, we had Chris Moneymaker, you know, this accountant won uh-huh. um not that like being an accountant like you shouldn't win poker, but like it wasn't a professional poker player. It was like some right. rando won a thirty three dollar satellite to get a buy into the ten thousand dollar main event and then won it. You know, for millions. Right. And and then it really exploded. But I feel like the movie kind of set the the kindling and, and had, mm-hmm. um, you know, the material there where people were then primed for, for yeah. this kind of explosion. I, I will say that I think it was also helped by the fact that when Chris won it, he had a name that if it had been created by Hollywood would have sounded so ridiculous. <laughs> like, it's quite a bit on the nose. <laughs> Quite killmonger well, of him, but moneymaker is his last There you go. So, yeah. uh, as you said, the, the plot of this movie isn't the most important part, but there's some, a couple twists and turns. Can you give mm-hmm. a uh, brief summary of the plot of this movie? Sure. Um, Mike McD is a poker player who goes and decides to play in the big game, which he is dramatically underrolled for, meaning he does not have enough money to responsibly play in this game. So he loses all of his money, and then he tells his girlfriend he's quitting poker, and he quits for a while. Then his friend Worm, who's like his kind of, you know, scum and villainy friend from childhood, (laughs) uh, gets out of prison and immediately gets, you know, drags him back into the poker world, basically by his own plight of owing $25,000 to a mobster. But at the end of it, you know... Worm has like gone off because he's he's a cheat and Mike doesn't really want to play that way and uh, Mike ends up being a poker player again and you know he's ostensibly a law school student for a while and that's mm-hmm. kind of the part of the plot that feels to me very contrived but it's like set up for him to kind of realize that coming back to poker for him isn't just about helping his buddy Worm 
but it's also about, you know, that it's his passion. It's something yeah. he loves. You know, he loves the game. He's great at it. And, you know, he wants to be one of the best and to, you know, challenge himself on the highest level. And that's that's basically, you know, what happens. And then he plays heads up against said mobster, which is John Malkovich. And uh, and it's it's pretty epic showdown albeit you know if you look at some of the hands you're like mm, that doesn't that that doesn't make sense you know <laughs> but but it's you know it's it's basically hollywood drama injected into poker that is functioning in the way that poker actually functions right like right. they are playing table stakes no one's betting their aston martin or anything right yeah it feels like much more of a real game and you're right like at the very end, they try to create some drama on the last hand of the game with John Malkovich, who the the Russian Eddie KGB, kind of teasing Mike about like, oh, I'm going to win this hand. All your hopes, all your dreams are down the toilet. Yeah. When the way it was set up is that Mike is crushing the game at that point, and so if he loses his hand, he still has like 60% of the chips. Um, so it's not like... Yeah, I just, I just rewatched it again. It was like... Mike's stack is like eight times as big as Eddie's for the, when mm. that last hand starts. Yeah, I'm I'm not I would have to actually like did you count the chips based on the denominations and everything like that? No, but I did see that when um when Mike pushed in the last to yeah. to, to call, he still had a lot of chips back. Yeah, well, yeah, but you don't actually. I, I would have to rewatch the scene to corroborate corroborate okay. that. Um, I, I'm a little bit skeptical, but he has been mounted a huge comeback already. This is like right. a coup de gras. It's not, you know, it, it's Teddy's just kind of like being Teddy, and yeah. you called him Eddie, which is not <laughs> yep. your usual kind of just mixing up names. We actually knew the real Eddie KGB. This was a person um, mm-hmm. who was this very sweet. Old, you know, this Russian dude who would like, I feel like he fought in World War II or something. Um, yeah. You know, and um, he he describes Texas Hold'em, you know, the Cadillac of poker as, that's the, car, that's the game where you take the two cards and you throw them in the middle. Because <laughs> he, <laughs> he was so tight. He just like, he just yeah. folded, like he just folded every hand in Hold'em. So it was kind of funny to turn him into this like, you know, gangster. Big bad mobster. Yeah. Well, yeah, and exactly. that's where I wanted to start start the conversation after the, the plot summers. Yeah, you and I both have a strong connection to this movie, and, and mm-hmm. you probably much more so than I, but uh, in the movie, at one point, they go to a, a club called the Chesterfield. That's based on a place called the Mayfair. Um, it wasn't quite as much wood paneling and nice lighting in the actual right. Mayfair. Yeah, it was but actual it was, bright lighting where you could see the cards and stuff, which, you know, is important. Is important. But it was a real club, and, like, KGB was a person. There was a guy named, I think, Joey Bagels instead of Joe Kanish. Yeah, Joey. Um, Zagush was a real person, if I remember yeah. correctly. Um, so, yeah, a lot of that movie is drawn from the, the real experience that Paul and I had playing poker for a long time. Yeah, the uh, the two authors went to play at the Mayfair uh, which is a kind of legendary underground club from New York where, mm-hmm. you know, people like Howard Lederer and I think Dan Harrington and like a bunch of like really well-known poker players, only some of whom cheated people out of millions of dollars. Um, <laughs> <Howard Lederer>. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's this legendary club that shut down, unfortunately, shortly after the two of us started playing there. But um, it was like the it, it was on like, you know, near Madison Avenue and in, in a very like. It was in a basement, but it was like a very fancy basement. They had a gourmet mm-hmm. kitchen. You know, it was it was a super nice place. And then there was also the Diamond Club, where I believe these authors also went to go, um, or, or screenwriters went to go, kind of research. You know, poker in in New York, and that was a place with the red walls and the had this very mm-hmm. dingy, more you know, it, it wasn't Russian mafia. It was like Irish, you know, Westies. You yeah. Know, um, but yeah, it was like these were two real places that were loosely interpreted, but like the things with like the little button around the neck, that was real, you know, mm-hmm. whether or not they were actually wired into the precinct or they were bluffing, I don't know. But, yeah. you know. Um, and, and, and it should be noted, the Mayfair did get shut down, not for being an illegal poker club, because they had been paying off the right people for that for ages. Um, yeah, and that's I, not I, even I, clearly illegal, just for the record. Yeah, what it, my understanding is, bec- it was that gourmet kitchen that Paul talked about. Yeah, yeah. Because of that, they were technically running an illegal restaurant, and so that's what got them busted. 
and they were dumping their garbage like too close to the elevator and it was underground with no windows and like they didn't have a permit and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So that that is what it got shut down for. And the Diamond Club ended up getting shut down for, you know, the people who ran the joint like playing in the games. And so they kind of like took it this way and that way. And, you know, th- mm-hmm. there was... This was uh, this was during Giuliani's you know reign of terror in New York, yep. right? Um, towards the end of it, and um, you know, it just the clubs had existed for a long time, and just finally decided, you know, I, I just want to, you know, be Giuliani, and mm-hmm. and since then, you know, there's there's tons of clubs still, of course. Right. I mean, they are everywhere, right? Even like there's there's private games in Las Vegas, even though there's you know twenty places oh, yeah. you could go play poker, but um, but like you know they get shut down with a certain regularity. I mean, I actually have a friend who, you know. I, did time in prison for not because he ran the club, but because he paid someone off. And, you know, it, mm-hmm. the whole thing is, it's just, it's, uh, we don't have to get too deep into that, but it's like, it, there's a lot of hypocrisy and nonsense in terms of how they actually handle, you know, these sorts of things from a, from a legal basis. Right. Right. And let's go a little deeper on that. Like talking about the, cause I think it, 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 it not only shows poker, quite well, which we'll get into, but it also shows the poker world quite well. Um, I, I never certainly was in hawk to the wrong person. I don't think either of you were, but certainly like those were stories we heard around. And just when you're playing poker that often, there's definitely a kind of way of seeing the world that I started having that I mm-hmm. really appreciated how much the like, and I think one of the frustrating parts about playing poker, this is getting a lot better now, is the difficulty in translating it. And I like, I think Joe, the, the relationship between Mike and Joe, to me, is a really interesting relationship of, like, to use the kind of cliched language, like a poker player and a civilian, mm. you know, in that I do think she's right. Like, sh- her language is critical of him because she doesn't really understand what poker is and what poker isn't. But also she's critical of him because this guy Worm is hella toxic and is pulling him down these terrible directions and he's lying to her and all that. Um but yeah, I, I just really talk about what would you think of kind of the way it showed the poker world, like not just the Mayfair, but like all of it. Yeah. And I mean, they they referenced games that then I found out about years later, you know, the I uh-huh. think what they call it, the goulash joint or something like I went yep. there or that I'm like, oh, OK, this is the, the, we're talking about this place, too. Like it really did capture the feel of. You know, just like the way it is playing poker in New York where there's no casinos, there's no official card rooms, you know, but there is a very vibrant poker scene. And, you know, just the way that it's there's like a sort of a little bit of a kind of surreal aspect to it. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, I'd find myself walking, you know, up 8th Avenue from 20th Street with like thousands of dollars in my pocket at six in the morning or four in the morning or two in the morning, whenever, you know, at any time. And it's like, this is a little odd, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's a little odd. And, and, um, but also just like how normal it feels when you're within sort of the, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, uh, whether you want to call it community or whatever, but sort of the the setting, you know, the various poker settings and how different some of them can be from one another, you know, like they show like playing with these, you know, these kind of, I, I guess maybe you'd call them yuppies. I don't know, but maybe that's not the right word, but like at this cigar shop, you know, and then he's playing uh-huh. with like these golf pros and then he's playing at this diner, you know, like, <laughs> does this look like a man beaten by jacks? Like, I, I I will forever regret that I did not go with our mutual friend to play with a bunch of cabbies yeah, in a, a great cab game. parking lot. <laughs> like, they played on the hood of a cab. They're playing for, you know, some reasonable sum of money. Like, it... it this is, but it's like people people play poker in all these different settings, you know. And yeah. since moving west, it's like I've, I've, I mean, you know, maybe I played in a home game, but like for the most part, you know, I played in casinos and I played in card rooms, and it's just interesting. You know, there's also a poker culture here, right? Um, right. And you know, Vegas is maybe different from California, where it's more locals and less kind of like touristy people, um, kind of people passing through. But you you do get like these these very different kind of vibes in the poker world and New York just has this very specific one that yeah. the movie captures very well. You know, I mean it's not spot on rendition, but it it really has the feel of it overall. 
It really does. And even when they go down to Atlantic City, that scene also felt, mm-hmm. um, for, for my graduation present, my mother took me and Paul down to uh, Atlantic City, which is our first time going to a casino. Um, and it was a really great trip. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just felt like that the Taj, that's a room that you and I have both played in quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, there were two main rooms there then at the time. I think Caesars had like a couple mm-hmm. of like two, four tables or something. But you had and by two, four, it was all limit Holden back then. Yeah. Right? It was all limit games and, and stud and stuff. But um, that, that is one of the funny things about the movie is watching that like poker still feels the same. But the poker culture has changed so much. And I think online poker has been a huge part. Like you said, the poker boom. Yeah. Like in some ways, this movie helped, not the only thing, but helped create the situation where it's now kind of obsolete. Because today, finding games that are not No Limit Hold'em is pretty difficult. Like you can find them, but like your average casino you go into, unless they have a lot of tables, they're probably mostly only playing No Limit. Most people who aren't super into poker, if they know poker, they know no limit. Um, you know, it, it has changed I think because of online poker and, and other things like that. The, the poker in the game, like the games are all the same, but it just feels like the way people play poker is very different today. I mean, so yes, the game has changed a lot. And yes, no limit games are much more prevalent than they were then, right? Mm-hmm. This was like, this is the one big no limit game, which, you know, at the Mayfair, there was one night a week, there was a big no limit game, which, you know, I played right. in at some point, And it felt very different to everything else. I will say that, you know, I mean, the last time I played in New York was was a while ago, but it was, it was not that long ago, you know? Right. And, and I, you know, there are still limit games, you know? There's okay. still people who play those games, and and so I I don't feel like the movie is um, I, I I wouldn't say obsolete. I would say uh, it's maybe less universal than maybe it felt back yeah. then. But maybe it didn't feel that universal to people like in Vegas or on the West Coast. You know, that's um, fair too. Yeah. And and also there is still a lot more limit hold'em in certain pockets of yeah. the of the country of the U.S. Anyway, I I don't know throughout the world how much there is aside from like but like California, a couple mm-hmm. places in Vegas, you know, and like yeah, you know, Foxwoods, and I I know where you live, right? They play a lot of Limit because there's some ordinance well, we play, on what the biggest we play this weird be. hybrid that's a spread. It's no Limit, but with a with a yeah. Limit on it. No, but they, they actually have weird. Limit. Like they do, yeah, yeah. But like, like when I went around the known country, as a big game there. When I went on the country, I spent a couple months going around the country playing at different casinos. And yeah, if it's a big poker place, they're going to have some stud and like the hardcore players are going to love that or the older players. Yeah. But like most places, if they only have a couple poker games going, it's always low, no limit. And like, right. When, or when I like talk- micro limit games, right? Like, yeah. Like 2-4 mm-hmm. or like 4-8 or something. I almost never saw those when really? I was going in other casinos. Yeah, okay. very. And and also when I just talk to other people, like when I like when I ask people about poker, what often comes up is no limit. Yeah, um, yeah. well, that's for and, sure, for sure. And even more so, not even just cash games, because I think the other thing that's become mm. semi legal is tournaments. Right. Uh, a lot of like in Madison, a lot of bars did tournaments poker. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so let's talk about poker itself, because I, I made the joke that poker is a superpower. Um, None of us were hit by radiation and able to do this. Um, but I know, Paul, you, you and I, you actually have a, a, a website out or did for a while called Poker is a Skill. Yeah. And to and so talk about what it is that you really like. Well, we'll get to the movie in a second. But first, just give a quick summary of like why, what it is that like Joe doesn't understand about poker in this movie and what a lot of people think don't understand about poker. Right. The, the character Joe. Um, mm-hmm. is, yeah, his girlfriend. Uh, I mean, I think... People have a hard time separating skill from chance, mm-hmm. particularly uh, I think people have a hard time understanding that both of those elements exist in almost every single thing we do in right. life, you know, and I think that poker kind of it like both distills and blurs that where you can tell very clearly like how somebody conceptualizes the game by how they talk about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you could just see by how someone plays, like whether they have some logical approach to the game, right? But also the results, like people think of the results. Oh, well, if you're good, you're going to win. If you're bad, you're going to lose. It's like, well, in the long run, yes. But in the short run and sometimes the medium run, there, you know, chance can be a huge factor, you know, and um, 
you know, this is the sort of thing I see like in business, people talk about, oh, well, it's all hard work and this and that. It's like, well, it's almost always hard work and good luck, right? Like right. anything that's very successful, any very successful venture. And you created the widget that was exactly what the market needed for whatever specific reason. Right. And like you did the work to create that widget and you did the work to like bring it to market and efficiently, you know, produce it and all that stuff. And, you know, maybe. Maybe you exploited some workers along the way, but like, <laughs> probably, you know, you were, you were fortunate to, to be in a situation where you had that opportunity. Um, but like, yeah, with with poker, I feel like chance like smacks you in the face in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. Like you're just constantly reminded of how many things you're not in control of. Right. But then also in the long run, skill really does prevail. And you can see how how people not manipulating chance but by understanding the odds of something you know you can make effective wagers right like right. if if the odds are 10 to 1 and you're getting offered 5 to 1 well that's that's not good but if you're getting offered 20 to 1 that's great doesn't matter right. that you only have like a 9% chance you know um, and so i think people just people just don't um, generally have a very functional, probabilistic understanding of the world, which to right. me is kind of the only effective understanding of the world. Like, if you don't understand how chance affects everything, then right. I, I think you, on some level, don't really understand anything. Right. And I think that's really vital because, like, as you said, I think because people look at the first half of the movie especially and go, well, isn't that always the danger? Is that you're going to hit one really bad hand, get really unlucky, and lose everything. And as you said, one of the points of the movie is that Mike wasn't playing responsibly. Right. The whole point is that if you are taking that, like to use your example, where you're only going to win 90%, where you're only going to win 9% of the time, but you're going to make so much money that it's going to pay you, that it's going to be worth it. The idea is that you have enough to lose 19 times or even 29 times. Or 100 if, times. I mean, you can iterate that wager. Right. Basically. Is the right. Because the point is supposed to be that you're going to win like a certain. Yeah, because and that that's what Mike doesn't have is that Mike right. doesn't. Mike puts all of his stake on one hand on one yeah. night of poker and then on one hand where you because, yeah, most of the time the hand he has in that situation is going to be a winning hand. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they're going to have the other two aces. Right. Exactly. And, and the, the key is like there's actual mathematical formula, formulas for um, this one called the Kelly criterion, which is like this is the amount that you can and should actually use as your wager if your bankroll is a certain size. Right. Your bankroll being all the money you have available to wager. And, right. you know, the answer is never all of it. Right. Unless yeah. it's 100 <laughs> percent. If it's literally a hundred percent, yeah, you can bet everything on it, right? But like, and you know, people think of like the phrase "all in," right? It's like, well, all in at the poker table means all the money you have right now on the poker table, you're putting right. in. But like, then you go into your pocket for more if you bust, right? Like, you're supposed to have. I mean, the the sort of for a while, the the common. Um, uh, what was it? Sort of just the guideline was like, oh, 20 buy-ins, right? So if he's playing mm -hmm. there with $30,000, he should have 20 times that. So 600000 you know? Right. But then it, it kept kind of, it was like, well, it should be 30. It should be 50. And it, the tougher the game is, the, the more you should have relative to it, you know? The, right. the more variance, the more volatile the game is, the more you should have. Now people say like 100 buy-ins. Well, then he should have $3 million to responsibly play in a game for, with a $30,000 buy-in. You know, right. most live players not doing that. But that's what, you know, it, truthfully, in, in a good live game, you don't actually need like a hundred buy-ins, but yeah. you need more than one, right? So, like, yeah, mm -hmm. he went bust. Not just because he got unlucky, he did get unlucky. He he got a cooler, right? The second yeah. not second best possible hand against the po best possible hand. That is an unlucky situation and you probably are supposed to lose all your money at the table in that situation but he made a, a choice which was a lack of skill it was being a bad gambler basically to wager right. way too much in that game in the first place and i appreciate using that word because like that's one of the arguments that mike and joe have where he actually says i think the exact line is like why do you still think this is gambling um what, as you understand it, how it, what is gambling and how does poker relate to that? All right. So first of all, there's like legal conversations about like what constitutes gambling, what's a game of chance, what's a game of skill. And we'll leave all of that by the wayside. Right. Right. Um, you know, gambling 
is basically risking money based on what an outcome is, right? And that is an element of poker. Um, mm -hmm. If Mike had said, why does this just, or why does this seem just like gambling to you? That right. I think is a, a real statement, you know, a fair statement. I, I think maybe, I don't remember the exact line, but like, you know, there is gambling involved, right? Like right. if you go all in and you show me your cards and I look at my cards and I have like a, say we're 50-50, right? I put money in, it's a good bet. It's plus EV gambling, meaning I expect in the long run, we repeat this wager, I'm going to make money. But like, that's it's still gambling, right? Right. The thing in poker that's a little different from like regular gambling is usually, unless you're like Pete Rose or like the 1919 White Sox, you betting on the thing doesn't influence the outcome of the thing, right? right. Whereas in poker, a wager, when you're the one betting, um, it's like a dare. It's like an ultimatum, right? Because there's always already something in the middle. And when, when I make a bet... It's not like I'm just betting on the outcome. I'm kind of like threatening you. I'm saying like, hey, you have to match this bet or I get all the money in the middle. So right. so in, in poker, like a poker bet, a wager, um, when you're the one taking the aggressive action is kind of something other than just like regular gambling. Right. Um, but, you know, obviously chance is a big aspect as well in the short run. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think one thing that the book, the movie also really captures is that like different poker players can gamble more or less than others. You yeah. know, like Kanish is presented as the rock. Like what mm -hmm. he does is he's playing the angles. All he wants to do is play the angles. And, and they kind of make fun of him, but he's making a living. He's like grinding out, making decent money at it. Um, and like I always, um, I have never, except for like one period of about a year, poker for me has always been much more of a hobby than a skill. And um, then, a, then a poker has always been much more of a hobby than it was like a form of employment. And so, and I think you can approach something and say, okay, I'm going to play the odds always and, and make my money. It's also fair to say, okay, I know, I know that chasing this flush is not the optimal play. I know that the joy I'm going to get, the rush I'm going to get if I win it sort of adds value to the amount that I'll win, and so I'm willing to take the chance, if that's money that I can afford to lose. To me, that's, that is a legitimate way to approach the game of poker, but that's now like increasing the amount that I'm gambling a lot, much more than uh, any of the players in the movie, but it's, well, except Worm, but he's a whole other thing, but certainly much more than Joey Kanish. Um, and I think that's another important part to think of, but I also think that pe where people get into a lot of trouble is when they don't understand those differences and they don't, they're do not they not able to understand what they're looking for out of the game. And Because to me, the essential part of that is also, if I sit down for a night of gambling, I have to be able to tell myself, okay, I have $200 I can lose tonight. I'm acting as though I would pay $200 for a night at the theater and a nice dinner. You know, like I, I'm committing that this is the price I'm paying for a night out rather than I want to gamble. And if I win, I can pay my rent. Like two fundamentally different kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you can approach poker as a game where you're just gambling, right? It right. can be that for you if that's what you want. And if that's what you want, fantastic. You know, have a budget. Um, and and please join my game, you know? Yeah. Like, that's, <laughs> Pe that's the reason like that. poker is so profitable. <clears throat> right. It's because a lot of people play it just for fun, right? And you get to win sometimes, right, if you play it that way. Like, that's, that's how it's set up. It's set yeah. up so that you can win some, but you'll lose more than you win, right, if you, if you play in that manner. And that's fine. That's a personal choice. And, you know, when I was saying Mike didn't have a large enough bankroll to... Uh, play in that game. So for him, essentially, then it, it kind of becomes gambling, right? Because he doesn't right. have the sufficient bankroll. If you're a recreational player, if you're playing just for fun, if you know you're not, if you don't expect to be a winner, or just like it's not a big deal if you win or lose in the long run, don't have a bankroll. You don't need a bankroll. Have a budget, right? Have a. Yeah. I'm fine losing this much money, and if I win, that's great, you know. And if I lose, yeah. I lose, right? But but this is my budget, and and that's where kind of the you know the responsible recreational player comes in, where it's like, yeah, have an idea of how much mm -hmm. you can afford to lose, and then that's fine, you know. You can spend that much on a, a dinner somewhere instead, but if this is what you prefer, you know, that's cool too. Yeah, you and I played in a home game for a while, and then I played in home games all through grad school and other places like that. And the way I always looked at it was, look. 
a lot of people would spend 20 or 40 bucks to go out for a night with their friends. I'm getting right. five hours of entertainment with my friends. Sometimes I'll pay as much as 40 or even 60. Most of the time I'm going to walk away with more money though. So yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I would look at it like I have five friends. Each of them are going to bring $20. I'm going to have $100 more at the end of the night. And, you know, somehow I have an apartment that you can pay $100 a month rent in Manhattan. In Hell's we we did subsidize that your lifestyle like for a couple of years. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, if you cannot tell, I am the recreational po- player. Paul, can I describe you as a professional poker player? I mean, it's how you have made your living yeah, yeah, for many yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that would be um, accurate, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So the one other thing just about talking about poker and then we'll start getting into sort of the ethics of it. Um, but like the one thing the movie does have that I, feels somewhat Hollywood to me, but I'm wondering what you have. Um, but it's the idea of spotting the other person's tell. And there's this thing in the movie where Eddie KGB does the thing with the Oreos. I think it's that when he, he has the hand, he'll eat, he'll crack open an Oreo. When he doesn't have it, he'll put the, the pieces back in the chip holder. When he has it, he'll eat the Oreo. Um, and they make a big deal about how Mike spots that tell and now he gains a big advantage. How realistic is that among players at the kind of top levels they're looking at? Well, I mean, depends on what you mean by the top level. Like, so first of all, pretty much everybody has some manner of tells, right? Right. Um, in terms of like eating Oreos when you have it, I don't know. I, I did spot my own tell not, not that long after um, seeing the movie. So like... My, my story of the movie is I, my mom moved in 1998 to Kansas City to take care of her brother and sister, and I stayed in New York, and so I was living by myself in New York. I had, you know, the apartment myself, and I was like, should I, like, be a pool player or a card player? You know? <laughs> Those were, like, my, my cho- That's what I was ch- deciding between, basically. And the preview, I saw the preview for Rounders. It made mm-hmm. me think, like... Ah, I'll play poker. Because, <laughs> like, just the one scene in the judges game in the preview was, like, so powerful to me. I was like, mm-hmm. that. I want to do that. Where I just yeah. see people and then I just know what they're thinking. I know what they're doing. Um, and I will say that um, that is a maybe a little bit of an over-the-top way of showing it. Dramatiz- but, yeah, it, it's tr- dramatizing it in a way that it could make sense in a movie. Yeah, the funny thing is, um, the first tell that I really realized I had, you know, was like when I'd get a good hand, I'd like I'd like kind of sit up and then I'd like I'd bet and I'd like I'd like like take a sip of my drink or something, you know? Because I was, I was like, so I annoyed when you stopped doing that. <laughs> no, I didn't stop doing that. I just started doing it when I didn't have a, a good. Hand. Okay, well, you, <laughs> it stopped working. <laughs> yeah, um, and. I, I put in my book, Way of the Poker Warrior, that there is this one tell that's fairly reliable that, like, yeah, when people are eating they and, and still betting, they, they mm-hmm. usually have a good hand. Like, that's that's real, you know? It right. doesn't have to be some specific Oreo cookie thing, it, but it's like, yeah, people usually, if they're eating, like, and they have a bad hand, they'll just fold. They're not, like, mixing it up. They're not getting in there. They're just like, I'm eating. And then they're like, oh, yeah. wait. I'm going to stop eating now and now I'm going to focus on this hand. Like, that's an obvious tell, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can use it as a reverse tell, too. You know, any tell you can always use as a reverse tell, you know? And right. I, I do think that there's an extent to which most players put too much emphasis on physical tells and often probably think they know things that they don't really know. You know, they yep. just see a correlation and they're like, oh, that's definitely a tell or that's those are correlated. It's like, no, they just coexisted at the same time, right? right? There's a lot of its coincidence. But if you really pay attention, like, yeah, you can you can build some pretty solid reads. So is that a particularly Hollywood way of de- delivering that message? Yes, but... Is it like way out of the realm of uh, you know uh, possibility? No, I don't think so. You know, it's not. Yeah. It's not like ridiculous. You know, it's just it's uh, you know it's it's accentuated. Right. That makes sense. So, and the last thing is kind of part of that. Talk about what what is it about the poker in this movie that makes it so much better than you know Maverick or something like that. I mean, they're playing poker. They're playing real poker games. You know, they're talking about high-low, and they talk about limit and pot limit and no limit. And, you know, the hands largely are fairly realistic. 
Um, there are some hands, like um, the one where Mike has kings at the end, and he raises to a thousand. The blinds are twenty five fifty, and he raises to a thousand. Maybe they're fifty a hundred, but he makes it like ten or twenty blinds, which is ridiculous. That's mm-hmm. not that's not a good that's not a good strategy. Um, <laughs> that's what you could tell call like a bet sizing tell, right? Not a right. physical tell, but a bet sizing tell. KGB makes it six grand out of ten <laughs> grand, which is sixty percent of his stack. And then Mike jams and Teddy KGB folds. And there's like almost no they I think what they did is they realized that they're like, okay, well kings have like 81% equity against queens. So they should win 81% of the time. So we'll have it be six grand so that he needs 80% equity. Uh, like like basically they made the math so that mm-hmm. if Mike showed his kings and KGB showed his queens, um, KGB would actually literally have a fold. But like you, you just, you don't fold there. You don't put in 60% of your stack and then fold. That's like... I mean, it's a rookie, rookie move, you know, and, and <laughs> right. I could believe a player doing that. I can't believe a player who's supposed to be of KGB's caliber doing that. Right. So mm-hmm. that one's like, all right there, you know, and like, <laughs> you know, folding top two pair on the ace five three. It's a little questionable, you know, but the one where he checked it three times with the nut straight, like that was uh-huh. beautiful. That's yeah, that's a thing, you know, and, and, and they reference the, you know, the Johnny Chan against uh, Eric Seidel. Right, like it's almost a little on the nose that he does exactly the thing that Johnny Chan did to win, but it's nice. And the fact, like, the fact that the the finale hand of poker is won by a straight where the player has eight nine. Right, right. Like, I I don't think there is another movie about poker where the winning hand the player doesn't have aces in their hand. You know, I mean, maybe like they have yeah, or a straight flush or something like that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah, it's always a monster. Like if you look at Casino Royale, which was a less bad poker, you know, representation than than general. I was like, I saw it and I was like, okay, that wasn't uh-huh. bad. It wasn't rounders, but it, it wasn't that bad. But like the final showdown hand, every you know, someone just got quads. Someone's got bigger quads. Someone has a straight flush. Someone has a royal flush. Like whatever it was, it was just, you know, ridiculous hand over ridiculous hand. And it's like, that's how they always play it, you know? Right. And so it, it's nice to see like, yeah, oh, it's a straight. It's the nuts, right? So it is the best possible straight hand in that scenario because of the way the game functions but like it's just a straight it's just like a 10 high straight or something you know yeah. and i i think I, honestly i i like that it's a hand that's basically the same as as that hand that johnny chan had right because mm-hmm. it shows like in the beginning they show him getting his money out of he has all these books right he's got yeah. all these poker books and in the 90s like you learned poker by reading books you know and like mm-hmm. some people did computer simulations and then they wrote up their results in books and he read the books. But like he's got all these books and I recognize all the books. They're like real poker books, you know. And I remember my friend came to my house and saw that I had just like this huge shelf of just like all the poker books. Only half of which your mom had given me for one Christmas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I had just tons of poker books and I read them and I would reread them and reread them. And I would like deal out cards myself and think, how will I play this? How will I play that? You know, like these are the tools we had, right? We had <laughs> books and we had a deck of cards and our imagination. And I really like that it showed here. He watched that over and over, you know, yeah. and he was trying to learn from it. He was trying to see people's tells. He was trying to see people's betting patterns. He was trying to learn from the best. And then that he applied that in the scene at the end. Like, I think that's powerful in terms of they don't talk that much about how he got good. Right. Mm-hmm. But you can see it. It's there. It's clear yeah. that he did work. He didn't just decide, oh, I'm going to play poker. And then he was just good. You know, he did the studying. Yeah. Yeah. I also did, love yeah, that. Yeah, Petra walks in and she immediately knows it's the 88 World Series. Like it helps yeah. show that like for people in that world, like this is what you would know. Right, exactly. Um, and yeah, I, I um, my mother was very supportive of both of us as we were getting started. There was mm-hmm. one Christmas where I think she just bought like half a shelf of poker books from Barnes and Noble or whatever. And then just like divided them randomly. said half of them to Paul, half of them to Matthew, because you all share them anyway. Right. Uh, which yeah. mostly meant that Paul would read them all and then tell me about them. Right. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I did like, read I some I have of this them. one already. Can I trade it for that one? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, my mother was always very proud of that. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some of the ethics involved. And the ethics of poker are very connected to the ethics of this movie, which we'll get into. Um, but 
like we've talked about the difficulty with that in poker, like, yeah, you can lose money. What about on the flip side? Because I think sometimes when people say like, oh, hey, like, you know, certainly I got this a lot. Like, don't you feel bad, like taking money from people who sometimes shouldn't be playing that money? You know, and I, right. I definitely had that feeling sometimes of like, if I was playing against someone who like pretty clearly had a gambling problem or something like it's it, sometimes I'd walk away. Sometimes I would keep playing. It's not a great feeling, though. Um but the worm quotes a line uh, that I think is a real quote that it's immoral to let a sucker keep his money. Yeah, that's a, that's and a real quote. Worm goes even further in terms of like cheating, which is a right. very different thing. But just in terms of the ethics of you know taking money from people who sometimes are not in the best state for it, um, although I think that's a, a rare, rare part of it. What's kind of your take on that and like the ethics of it? Yeah, I mean, I respect people's agency. <laughs> You know, if you mm-hmm. come to the poker table, I'm going to try and take your money. If you don't want to come yeah. to the poker table, I'm not going to try and talk you into it. You know? Yeah. And if you say you're leaving for the night, I'll just wish you a good night. You know, there, there's definitely sometimes an element of people like really trying to, oh, let me buy you a drink. Oh, like I, this one, you know, well-known live pro who was very successful. Like I was playing in a game with him one time. And then there's this person who was really, really bad at the game. Very nice person, but like really bad at the game and was leaving. And then he just, like, starts, like, flirting with her, clearly, like, kind of in a way to try and get her to stay in the game. You know, I was like, oh God. this doesn't feel good. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, and sometimes people are, like, so, like, obsequious and, like, oh, let me get that for you for, like, the people who are kind of, like, the spot, right? And it's like, right. you know, this is the person who everybody's, like, trying to take their money. And, you know, because usually there are a few players that it's just like, this is the reason, you know, I mean, I I think I, in my book, I called him like the reason for poker, you know, like basically like we have poker played on the scale we do because there are people who basically just come and just play for fun. And and that's great. But like that games go because of that. right? Right. And I think like. I think it's important to create an atmosphere where somebody can come and have fun and play in a fair game, right? And be treated with respect. Mm -hmm. And when they want to leave, they leave. And they want to show up, they show up, you know? But, like, I think some of the things that people do in terms of, like, trying to, like, really, you know, get people to play worse either by, like, being really nasty and trying to throw them on tilt um, or, like you know, try to get people really drunk. Like, if you're somewhere that people are going to drive home, like, don't try and get people really drunk. Like, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like, um, but like, yeah, I think some of that, like, is is pretty gross to me. But like, you know, when somebody of their own volition comes to a poker table, like, I'm going to just trust that, like, that's their choice. And like, I respect people's choices. Yeah, like, I got to a point where I realized my favorite games were like home games are one thing we know no one's like losing their shirt but when i was playing bigger money games i mostly like doing it in in places where people went on vacation to do it mm. because it felt like a i mean it's better games because it is those people who like we like like i am sometimes right. where it's just like they're playing for the thrill not just mm-hmm. grinding for the money but also that to me much more feel like there's a big difference between g- going to vegas on vacation and blowing all your money at Vegas versus like playing for your rent, you know, and um, I, I just got to a point playing where like particularly I used to play some games in Gary, Indiana um, mm-hmm. at casinos there. The games in Chicago were fantastic, but there's some games in Gary, Indiana that were good games, but just I'd see the people there all the same people there all the time. Some of whom clearly like should not have been still playing, and and you know you, the way they talked, you, you, they would always be like, no, no, I'm just gonna get it all back this this mm. this session or something like right, that. Right. And then, yeah, I, I think it, it's a it's a dichotomy that each person's got to find for themselves about where you where you're comfortable with. But I really like the way you draw that line of like, yeah, if the person volunteers to sit down at the table, you're going to play against them. But it, it's when you try to like influence them to stay at the table or you know the kind of like sh- uh, ridiculous stuff like that. That's where you draw the line. Yeah, I mean, I I generally prefer playing with kind of the same people over and over and have that kind of like. Mm-hmm more of kind of like a club feel or like I know the people, they know me, we're friendly. Right. Like it's like we're hanging out and playing a game, you know? Yeah. And I'm just winning most of the time because I'm playing yeah. it well, you know, and they're they're not usually, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it. I mean, certainly there can be uncomfortable spots where – and I, I feel like that can be kind of like with anything, you know? Yeah. Like where you see someone doing something, engaging in some repetitive behavior, and it's like it seems like it's not the best. But then, it, you know, and it's like, well, is it is it for me to bring it up to them or or what, you know? Right. 
Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, and all that though, because in the movie, like the Worm and 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 Mike work together well. And there's kind of like a number of levels in which that happens that go from like just being two players at the same table who respect each other, uh, which kind of happens in Atlantic City, all the way to like outright, you know, the full on cheating that Worm is doing. Um, I know you have very strong feelings on cheating. Talk about that, like where, where the line is and why it's so important to you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, cheating's cheating. Like breaking the rules to gain an advantage is cheating, right? That's, right. And cheating in a game played for money is, is theft. You're just stealing money from people. And, yeah. you know, as an anarchist, I feel, you know, property <laughs> crimes don't have the same sort of weight to me that, uh, mm -hmm. that they might to, to some other people. But, like, I still don't think it's good, you know? Right. And so it's like, yeah, it, you know, to me, though, like, on top of, like, whatever, you know, robbing someone of money, which um, I, I have a, an instance of, of being cheated that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but... On top of that, it just like as, um, you know, an avid poker enthusiast, as someone who, who loves the game and sort of the things you can learn from it and, um, you know, the nuances, I feel like it's an affront to the game. You yeah. know, it's like it really undermines everything to me that is interesting about the game is predicated on an assumption that everybody's playing by the rules, you know, and yeah. you you said something about angles earlier, and I think I think they do say like you see all the angles and whatever, but you never have the stones to play them or something like that. But like angles actually has like a negative connotation of basically manipulating the rules in an, in a fashion that's like kind of unclear to to exploit certain like mm -hmm. sort of almost like almost like exploiting a legal a legal exploiting a legal loophole for some sort of gain, right? Where you're kind of like tricking someone in some way, right. which to me is very different from like acting strong when you're weak or acting strong when you're strong or like telling someone, you know, oh, I totally have it. And they never believe you. And then you have it, but you know, they're going to call down. It's like, that's, you know, there's a certain kind of like manipulation that's like, I think is reasonable right. and can be part of the game. Um, there's also games where it's not so much part of the game, but, but like, there, you know, there's that kind of angling, which to me is like dirty and frowned upon. And then there's like, you know, Worm is engaging in the just outright, he is manipulating the cards, right? Right. So because he's dealing, because in some of these clubs you could deal in home games, you, you know, somebody's dealing, right? Um, at, at the Mayfair, which we played at, like players actually dealt, right? And so when he's at the Chesterfield, that they show that. Mm -hmm. um, and. We get less of that now, but like, you know, using a marked deck would be another example of, of cheating where you're right. not manipulating the cards, but now you're being able to get information that you're not supposed to be entitled to, you know, or like leaning back and looking at your opponent's cards like that's cheating, you know, right. and and it it ruins the game because if you're in a game where you might be getting cheated and it's like. If your edge is going to be a certain amount, it's not going to be massive. It's going to be a fairly thin edge. And you're playing for a lot of money. And there's a chance that you're getting cheated. You can't even play in that game. Because basically right. it goes from, you know, say there's a 95% chance that you have this small edge to a 5% chance that you are just crushed. That you're going to lose 100% of the time, you know. Um, and I'll, I'll use this example of um, I played in this live stream game at uh, Stone's Gambling Hall in... I think it's Citrus Heights, but it's basically like Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And they had this live stream that was on, um, it was on YouTube and Twitch for a number of years. So you were years. playing a physical game. I was playing physical cards. Free. Yeah. Yeah, which was being live streamed. And what they do is they have this RFID technology, right? So the cards, uh, you slide them over the sensor and then it knows what the cards are. And then they have a, a stream where they have graphics that come up and shows what everybody's hold cards are, right? And... That's on a 30 minute delay. So you can't tell what anybody has while you're playing, right? right. You can't, did, people did have like the stream up and they were looking, oh, that's what they had 30 minutes ago. And I was like, I don't really like that. You know, I think mm -hmm. that kind of sucks, but like, I guess what are you gonna do? You know, maybe people will get texts and like, I wanna take everybody's devices away, you know? Right. I'm like, put everybody in a bubble, take their devices away, you get it back at the end of the hand. But it'll be harder to get people to do it for that. Um, but hold on one second. 
Yeah, my ADHD ass could never survive at a poker table unless I had, like, a game to play on my phone or, you know, a book. Except it did for years. You know what I mean? Oh, no, I always brought a book. Like, I did all of my studying for grad school by bringing games. Oh, yeah, but then it's because we're bantering with each other all the time. That's the thing. Like, if it's a six handed game or if it's a, you know, anyway. Um, But, like, that's the world we live in now, right? Right. And and I understand it's more of a like a, a legit struggle for some people than other yeah. people. It's kind of just whatever. Um, but I will say that anyway, th- this person was just crushing the game, right? And I, I folded a couple of not really big hands to them, but I, I, I folded a couple hands to them, and in in decent sized pots. And I went and looked at the the live stream the next day, and I was like, what? Like they had called, I had somebody raised, tight player at the table raised. I'm the second tightest player, meaning like I'm going to have the best cards when I'm putting in this kind of aggression, right? I re raise, and this person cold calls with, was it, I think it was five deuce suited or something like that, which okay. is a terrible a very hand. bad hand, yeah. A, they call it with a very bad hand, and the board comes out ace eight five, right? And they just lead out into the two tightest players at the table. This is an absolutely absurd play it doesn't make any sense but you know we both folded i had pocket jacks i'm like i'm not ca- they let out into me i'm not calling on this a side board and then there was another one where they actually had deuce three offsuit they had called my race pre-flop and then the flop came came the most racist flop in poker um it's all kings and mm. i bet and they call and then the turn is like a deuce or a three, and I check and they bit big and actually folded, which I probably shouldn't have folded, but whatever. And here's the thing. Here's the thing that made this very interesting to me. Both of these hands, I felt like they had a tell, and the tell mm-hmm. was confidence. Right. And when I found out later, I realized, when I found out that they'd been cheating, they, they had a phone in their lap like in their crotch, basically, they were looking down and they, they had the whole card information in live t- time, right? And this oh, wow, has basically okay. been, everybody knows this now. Um, it was unsuccessfully kind of prosecuted in court, but it's pretty clear that they cheated for over $100,000 of winnings over like 80 or so live games. They just basically never lost and they made some of the most absurd plays you'll ever see. And these, these were not sk- sensible, skilled plays that any good player makes right. it was clearly they were cheating and of course they were confident they were confident because yeah. they knew what my hand was you know so that's that's where like the idea of tells of like seeing you see a physical reaction of whether someone really is you can really read someone for being confident or not but like you know one time i read someone for like i was like i'm pretty sure this dude just has a pair of kings you know and i had two pair and they turned they're like kings i'm like ah, i knew it and then they turn up their whole cards. I'm like, Bob, you, you've got three kings. He's like, I do? And this was yeah. a, a very, very <laughs> drunk anesthesiologist. And I was like, ah, oh, man. And it's like I knew what he thought he had, but he didn't know what he had. So, you know, you can't read that. Um, but, yeah, you know, and it, it really, I think, every time one of these things comes out, right? And there's different – there's methods of online cheating and all that. <coughs> Every time one of these instances comes out and gets, you know, I mean, I think it's good that it becomes public. I think it's good when people right. discover it. But it's always like it just it chips away at people's confidence in the games they play in, you know, and it, it makes people think, oh, am I getting cheated here? Am I getting cheated here? And like, yeah, you should always have your eyes open. Right. Keep right. Stay alert for suspicious things. But like most of the time you're not getting cheated. You're, you're not getting cheated all the time. Usually you're losing. Because either A, you're bad at poker, or B, like, random things happen that seem really unlikely, but they happen. You know, a one in a thousand chance will happen every thousand times. Like, it, yeah. it'll happen, you know? And, like, you play enough hands and you see these things and you're like, yeah, that okay, yeah, that was weird. But, like, you know. But, yeah, it just really kind of, it ruins the game for a lot of people, I think. Mm-hmm. And that's really, yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. I think that's really true, yeah. And, it, I mean... I make my living around Magic the Gathering now, and it's the exact mm-hmm. same thing. There's been a lot mm-hmm. of issues around cheating in Magic, and it definitely has happened in, in a number of different ways. Everything from fake cards to people like dealing off bottoms of decks and all kinds of stuff like that. And we're getting better and better at finding it, but still is a problem. I think it's the same thing. It's because there's a fundamental aspect of trust. When you play a game against someone for a prize, 
you have to believe that you're both playing fair. Right. And like whatever is decided is fairness beforehand, but you know that's sitting down. And because some people would say no limit isn't fair, some people would say limit isn't fair. That's fine. You choose the game you want to play. But once you make that choice, that's that's the rule. And it's when people cheat that it really kind of gets ruined. Yeah. Um. We go on. Oh, I, I don't know how someone would think no limit isn't fair or limit isn't fair, but people definitely dislike the games, you know, different. They, yeah. People have very strong opinions on why which game is better than, oh, you can't get anybody to fold in limit. It's like, okay, <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, all right, so let's talk about, so let's get back more into the movie, but I think it's going to, the, the, the poker thinking is very much a part of the different characters. And let's talk about Michael, because... Mm-hmm. Uh, Mikey, he makes a number of interesting decisions to the course of the movie, and some of them have to do with poker, and we'll get to those. But first, let's just talk about um, what he does with Worm, because I mm. think that, like, in the movie, they talk about, like, the outlaw Josie Wales, he never turns it, he would always go back for a friend, that that's, like, the right thing to do. Um, you know, it's the Han Solo move, like, in many right, ways. Right. It's, you know, yeah. I kind of wish they'd made that reference instead of Clint Eastwood, but fair enough. Um, uh, but they're also a little older, so that's fine. But, like, but I think part of what happens over the course of the movie is he starts to get to a point and eventually gets to the point of realizing I my my loyalty to this guy from childhood, like, can't go on. What, what do you think of Mike's decision-making there? And, like, should he have cut him off when he did? Should he have cut him off beforehand? Like, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess if I have a biggest complaint about the movie is that it does feel like the moral of the story is kind of like cheating's bad, don't cheat, but it also kind of makes it feel like, eh, maybe it's kind of okay for a while, you know? And mm-hmm. it... it uh, I'd love to see a great poker movie where cheating just isn't even part of it, right? Isn't yeah. part of the story. So so I don't love that aspect of it. I do think, you know, Mike's in a tough spot, right? Where he's got this loyalty to his friend. He's got loyalty to his girlfriend. He's got kind of loyalty to his own um, decisions and, like, what he wants to do with his life, you know? And, I mean, I'm I'm very pro you know doubling back for a friend basic right right like like yeah and and potentially doing things at times that's like it's not really what i would want to do but like mm-hmm. if it's between this and like you know letting someone just like twist in the wind like i don't know you got to make a choice right um you know i i will say like i feel like going in and cheating a bunch of uh you know trust fund people like doesn't feel the same to me like it's the same on the level of like the affront to the game you know right they're like i mean if you want to steal money from people with trust funds i don't really care like you know like i just i just i can't get worked up about that right yeah Um, it's like the difference between like someone shoplifting at walmart versus shoplifting at a mom and pop store like <clears throat> if yeah. you see someone shoplifting at Walmart, no, you didn't see anything. Yeah. Right. Although at the same time, like if you see someone shift, like those types of places, I don't know, is someone going to get fired? Is it like if it's in a casino and they're like cheating the cashier, it's like the cashier's probably going to get fired. And now what's going on? You know what I mean? Right. But like, but yeah, it, that, that's that's at its root a very good uh, comparison, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and so like it kind of feels like you know those guys are like they're kind of jerks you know and it's kind of like yeah whatever i don't mind chad getting ripped off and uh-huh. um you know and then the other one's like a bunch of cops and it's like well you know eh. <laughs> got evolving views on you know i mean they're all dressed like a bunch of like stormtroopers kind of too you know? <laughs> so like um not the star wars ones um and so like it you know, it's it's different than like if it was like at the at the diner. You know, I right. feel like like cheating at the diner would have a different feel to it. And and you know, the only other people we see worm cheating are like these mob guys. You know, right? And so it's like, I don't know. We like it when you see shows or movies. Like you know, it's it's a little bit Robin Hood feeling, right? Yeah. Because like worm somebody who like didn't grow up with money, right? And mm-hmm. basically just kind of like did what um what he could in order to try to get ahead and he was willing to just kind of do anything right Right. and and i appreciate that as a character i think that makes an interesting character um and then mike 
you know, Mike, like, is going to law school because, like, maybe he wants to be a lawyer. But, like, he doesn't really want to be a lawyer. Like, he's yeah. – you can tell, like, his heart's never really in it, right? And and I do feel like that part of it is, like, the weakest part of the story. Um, but, like, Mike has this respect for the game. I think Mike loves poker, right? And yeah. so that, like, going against that and being willing to cheat with Worm – I think hurts him, you know, on some yeah. level. So it's like, I feel like for him turning back to double, double back for worm, isn't just like sacrificing sort of, you know, breaking a promise to his girlfriend and breaking a promise to himself about not, you know, getting involved in this anymore. It's like, it's like violating like how he feels about the game, you know? So it right. is kind of this sacrifice and it ends up at the end. He's just like, this isn't, this isn't the way I want to do things. You know, I'm going to go right. back and I'm going to try and, you know, face KGB and, and deal with things in a straight up fashion. And and that's kind of like that along with like realizing, you know, yeah, I, I'm a poker player, you know, right. That to me is um, that's like the character growth. Right. In, in right. the movie. Well, and it's interesting that you focus on the cheating there, because for me, like, yes, worm cheating isn't great. And like, Every time Mike gets involved, he kind of doesn't want to, but like Worm is Worm just deals him the good cards, and right. sometimes he folds them, sometimes yeah, he, folds he doesn't. Yeah. Um, but to me, like the thing with Worm is, it's not just that he's a cheater; it's that he has no ability to know where to stop. You know, right, and so he right, keeps yeah. getting Mike into more and more and more trouble. Yeah. And bad like, judgment. <laughs> And, yeah, exactly. And, and like I said, someone's always got to quote the Eddie KGB. Exactly. Um, Teddy KGB. <laughs> uh, I can't, I now just think of it as Eddie KGB. Yeah, I know. That's, that's fair. Who's such a different person. Um, such but a like, person. Because to me, that's, I think, one of the most heartbreaking parts of the movie. And this is somewhat of a cliche of a story, but I don't think I see it told this well, is that idea of like two poor kids who are both doing what they can to get by. They get caught. But one of them, like, takes the rap, doesn't yeah. rat out the other one. And then the other one goes on and is fairly successful, while the mm -hmm. other one, like, you know, doesn't finish school, goes to jail. And yeah. I really feel for Mike that not only does he have, like, this is his friend, but also, like, Mike knows that he is in law school because his friend yeah. didn't rat him out, you know, yeah. and because his friend got expelled. And so I think there's an added feeling of he feels somewhat responsible and somewhat, like, I got out, I should reach a hand down to pull this guy out. And in a lot of movies, what they would show you is that Mike will never, ever give up on Worm, and Worm will eventually do the right thing, right. and like everyone live happily after. And it's hard to think that Mike gets to a point where he does have to cut out Worm. But I really like that. Like, yeah. And I, I, I like that it shows that, and that, like you said, Mike is willing to not only just run, but he's also willing to go back into... To, to, to give it his all and he wants to play fair because yeah he could just go back to trying to cheat those games again um, but the whole time he's trying to run out the money he doesn't want to cheat yeah. he's angry when, when Worm deals on the cheating cards and when yeah. he goes into KGB is like you can't cheat in that place you're going to get killed right yeah exactly exactly um, yeah I, I, I really like that view of you know you do get a lot of stories of somebody like not wanting to give up on someone and then it always works out you know right and it's like sometimes it doesn't you know sometimes yeah. somebody just isn't going to change you know they just yeah. or they're not going to change right then and like maybe sometimes you have to accept that you know and um yeah and it's it's for you know some of it's for his own good but some of it's also he's just like look you know i i gave you a lot of chances right and where did i get i i got beaten up <laughs> you know i'm broke like everything went mm. bad and it really is just totally your fault you know and it's like yeah. um yeah it's not like one strike and you're out it's like a, a whole bunch a whole bunch and um you know and then worm just goes on his way and they they part ways and like right. i think that's fine you know so another interesting thing about mike's character i think is this kind of debate he's having with um with kanish um, you know, Kanish wanting to be the grinder. He wants to be the person who just kind of like grinds it out. He makes the money. He pays rent. He pays alimony and child support, which also makes sense because like John Turturro is such a good actor. And like when you tell me that that actor is divorced with a kid, it's like, of course he is. <laughs> like, it just, the, the, the performances of John Turturro, Martin Landau and John Malkovich are so good. Yeah. Um, we'll get into that in a bit. But like where do you – it does seem to me like Mike is portrayed as – 
a very, very skilled poker player, but someone who wants to gamble a bit because he's what he's he's now has a thirty thousand dollar bankroll, and he's not going to the games where he's playing buying in for three hundred where he'd have a hundred. He wants to take that thirty thousand to Vegas um, and roll up a stake. What where where do you kind of see? I'm curious where you see yourself in between kind of like Mike and and uh, Kanish, but also sort of what you, what you think it says about Mikey's character. Yeah, so I, I don't think he's going back to what he was doing in the beginning where he's going to buy in for 30K and no limit. You know, right. go, going fair. to yeah. Vegas and, and playing, like, is, is very different, right? Yeah. Um, and it's unclear, like, exactly what games he'll play. Maybe he'll buy in for 10K at the World Series. And if you have 30000 and you want to put 10K into one game, but you have another game that's going to be your regular game that you're still going to be properly bankrolled for with 20K, assuming that you don't win anything from the 10K, you know, mm-hmm. that's fine. That could be a responsible decision. Um I, I think it's at the end of it, it's like he he kind of he learned from his mistake, which was like putting everything on one thing, right? Mm-hmm. But like he still, you know, Kanish is happy just grinding it out in 10, 20 games or whatever, playing, you know, making 20 bucks an hour, 30 bucks an hour or whatever, and and paying his expenses. And, you know, and he's got a kid, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah he has responsibilities that Mike doesn't have. And so that's right. harder, right? It's you can't be as much of an adventurer kind of, which is right. uh, the way I've, I've seen it described of sort of like, you know, yeah, you you can take shots. It's OK to take shots. Like the only way you move up is by moving up. Right. right. And like Mike wants to play with tougher players in bigger games in order to continue to grow as a player. It's like, you know, it's like Kanish wants to play double A ball for his whole life. And Mike's mm-hmm. like, no, I, I want to play in the show, you know? Yeah. And it's like, maybe he'll make it, maybe he won't. But the point is he's going to take a shot there. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's always risk in everything, you know? I mean, even right. if you just play the most simple grindish whatever, like... I don't know. You could be in the club and somebody could get robbed and somebody could drop their shotgun and shoot you and you're dead. Like, yeah. you know, that, that sadly that actually happened. Um, and in a New York club. But, you know, yeah, Mike wants to push himself and challenge himself and like kind of get to the next level, you know. And, right. and so he is willing to take on a certain amount of risk. But I think he also has the confidence that like if things don't go well – you know he's not going to buy into one game for all his money. I, I don't. Right. I don't believe that's the the path he's going to tread from there. Well, so that leads to what I think is the most interesting dis- decision of the movie, which is that the movie sets it up that because um, you'd think normally the way that the movie would go is that he has to play because I mean he's literally playing for his life. The implication right. is that they're going to kill him. And it's another little weird part is it seems like grandma would rather kill him than get the money from him. Which yeah, yeah, yeah. Is not I, I, I mean, my, like, I, I don't think KGB would have actually killed him. I think he would have been like, you have to play for me now for the next 10 years. You know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> like, I think he was like, now I own you, basically. Yeah. And Intense grandma's like, ah, I want to see you kill him. And I'm like, grandma, what is <laughs> Grandma wrong definitely with you, wants grandma? him dead. Not necessarily KGB. Yeah. But, but clearly, like, he's in a very, very bad situation if he loses. But he wins enough to cover, and then there's all the great jokes about the so unsatisfied uh, and all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then he buys back in. Right. With the stake that he meet, like he is now again risking his life or his freedom or yeah, something yeah, yeah. like that yeah. for one more shot. What do you like? It, it creates great drama and it creates the great payoff at the end of the movie. But what, like, because this is all before he, he, he finds the tell and he's losing for a while. What what is your take on like him making that last decision? Because that, that that seems like a very gambler decision. I mean, it's a terrible choice. That's just not okay. a good decision, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like you have to basically have you know infinity to to zero odds. Like you need uh-huh. to be certain that that's how it's gonna gonna happen, right? So it <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's just just like don't that don't do that, you know. Um, so, like, yeah, and and that, you know, okay, maybe he still does have that overconfidence, right. that hubris, you know, in, in a way where um, he, he doesn't, he hasn't gotten to the, um, to the point of, mm-hmm. of, like, understanding, like, yeah, you, you really, like, 
take a step back. You've got yeah. five grand, right? You can, because what he he bought in for he bought in for ten k. He owed him fifteen still because they'd uh-huh. already paid him ten, right? Yeah. So so basically, he would get that. He would have five grand back, right? Oh, halfway to paying Petrovsky, right? And mm-hmm. then he would have to take that five grand and gr- grind it up to be where he could then pay off Petrovsky another ten grand, and then eventually have money of his own to you know do whatever. So like, right. yeah, bad, bad. Bad judgment. Bad <laughs> okay. judgment. Yeah, but, and, and I kind of like that because yeah. um, uh, Blabs Abs in the chat says killing someone who owes you money is a bad way to collect. I would completely agree, and that's kind of mm. a funny thing from Grandma. It's like yeah, yeah. It, that's again where it feels a little bit Hollywood to me. But yeah, I appreciate that because it's. I mean, Mal- John Malkovich, KGB, goads him into it. He gives this right. great speech about like, oh, I'm so unsatisfied, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 it's it's. It's, it feels like that our character hasn't had a full, like, 180, learned all of his lessons, character redemption moment. Yeah. And I like that. Sure. Because I like that what it's showing is, like, yeah, he is still going to be a bit of a gambler. He is right. still going to be someone who likes the thrill. But he's learned some lessons about it, and he's going to do it on his own. And he's not going to get wrapped up with someone like KG, with someone Worm. like Worm again. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's that's... To me, that's a good place for the character to get to, and it's a lot better than some like super moralistic, like everything works out perfectly, and he's the the best person in the world. Right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it does feel like a reasonable. This is how I feel people grow. Right? I feel yeah. people tend to learn some lessons and make a small improvement, and then often need to face that lesson several times to actually kind of get yeah. there and then still probably have some of the tendencies that they had before but they're more manageable right this this yeah. feels to me more like realistic you know uh character development than like oh and now i see the way and then everything was yeah. clear to me and it's like okay well yeah i mean not that that can't happen but i think it's much less common at the at a yeah minimum. agreed i want to go back to the cheating thing because one thing i realized i forgot to ask in that sort of idea of like the difference between like playing the angles or, or like angle shooting versus like full on cheating with angle shooting being kind of somewhere in the middle and but you know playing angles being legit when they all go to Atlantic City it, it stated that like they're not actively collaborating with each other but they are somewhat intent they all know who are the good players who are not yeah and they're all kind of staying out of each other's way so that basically they're just all trying to feed off of whoever sits in those two seats mm-hmm where does that sit for you in terms of the like legit versus, versus illegitimate play? Yeah, I mean, I think that's fine. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. as long as you're playing on your own money, they're playing on their own money, and you're not talking about <laughs> making different plays in order to kind of help each other, I think that's fine. You know, right. I think there are things where people are like, oh, do you want to check it down? I'm like, that's not fine. But then that's usually against players who aren't that great. And then it's like, right. okay, you kind of let it slide. That's like soft play, right? This is kind of like implied, unstated soft play where, um, first of all, that's not often been – well, I wouldn't say it's not my experience. But, like, it's the sort of thing that happens, right, where mm-hmm. you basically – but. But it can just be a rational decision each player is making on their own. Like, right. oh, somebody who I know plays well and only plays good cards has entered the pot. I need, now need a really good hand to want to continue, right? right. Um, unless it's some sort of multi-way situation and it's like, okay, now we can all kind of you know play hands that are speculative and one of these other players is going to get in there with a hand that they have no business being in the pot with and then whichever one of us makes our hand is going to make money from them. Right. And that's like, I think as long as nobody's like talking to each other about, you know, if somebody in the bathroom's like, oh, hey, you know, why did you bet that hand against me? It's like, okay, that's that's not good. Why are yeah. you talking to me in the bathroom? But uh, also, you know, wash your hands. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but mostly, like, yeah, you shouldn't be talking about, you know, you can talk about hands. That's fine, right? But you shouldn't right. be telling other people they should play a certain way against you so that you're not, you know, going up against each other. And right, and exactly. that type of thing sometimes does get a little bit more uh, overtly stated. And I'm uncomfortable right. with that, right? I think that can be anywhere from, like, verging on 
cheating to like actual cheating, you know, and mm-hmm. and s- s- some of these things do have a little bit of like a murky line, you know, and then other yeah. things like, nope, that's that's a bright line, you know. So here it's like that that exact situation as portrayed in the movie. I think mm-hmm. it's fine, you know. Yeah. Um, but some situations that are similar but a little different, less fine, you know. Yeah. Like at the Mayfair, I used to play with three couples in the same game. Uh-huh. So there'd be six people. Three of them are pairs who share money. Right. And then some of them don't want to bet against each other. It, right. Not just the pairs, but like other couples with the other co- – and it's like, like how, how am I supposed to play that game yeah. where six of you are basically on the same team? You know what I mean? Right. And, and that was actually even one of the tougher games, so that, that was, that was mm-hmm. a bit rough. Yeah. So back to the characters. Um, I don't know if there's much to say about Worm. Like, I think they do a good job portraying that he's not just, like, a terrible person. He's a kid who had, like, this really awful background. He got beaten by his father. He got caught doing these things. Like, to me, he's a person who... I don't know if I'd say he's addicted to gambling as much as he's just sort of, like, just addicted to the rush or whatever it is. But, like, clearly he's someone who, like... He doesn't make good decisions. And given his background, I understand that. But I feel like he definitely is, like... I don't feel like he's being betrayed when Mike eventually does cut him off, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, that seems like a fine decision for Mike and and like Worm's like, all right, whatever. Um I I think I don't think he's gambling at all. Mm. It, there's an old I think it's W. C. Fields quote, you know, something you know, poker or whatever is a game of chance. Not the way I play it. Uh-huh. <laughs> like I mean he's cheating. You're not gambling if you're cheating. Well, you but he's I mean? gambling in that like no one's gonna catch. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he no, also I mean, like, he's risking something. He's gambling something in life terms. But like, right. He's he's actually fixing the game, you know, which makes it not right. actually gambling. It's a then it's like a well, he's he's conning that, people is what he's doing basically. Yeah, and that's why I said it's know? not as much a gamble addiction as much more like a rush. Like, I mean, yeah. he does play all that blackjack and loses a lot of money doing that. But like. To me, it just feels like yeah, he he him and Kanish are the exact are the full opposite ends of each other. Yeah, you know, with yeah. Mike being somewhere in the middle. Yeah, except like Worm, like he's not a poker player; he's a you know a mechanic. Right. You know, he uses poker as a me, but I mean, he would cheat at uh, what are they playing? Hearts in the beginning. Yeah. In prison, right? Like he'll cheat at that, right? Like he'll mm-hmm. cheat at any card game. So yeah, he he to me is not like. A poker player, he's like a, you know, a a, a, a hustler, like, and not yeah. like in a good way, hustler. Like he's he's like he's clearly just, you know, he's the. It's immoral to let a sucker keep his money, you know. Yeah. Um, he would definitely do the like, let me buy you a drink to keep you at the table, kind of a thing. Hundred percent. He'd do whatever he thought. Right. He w- was in his power to like, you know, get one over on someone, and I th- I think for him it is like a game and it's playful. You know, mm-hmm. um, more than it's just like selfish and greedy. You know, I, I right. do I do think it's like, you know, kind of addicted to the adrenaline. Sure. You know, but like also just like I think that's just what he thinks is fun. And that's just like how yeah. he wants to live. And it doesn't seem like a great way to live, but it's like, you know, it's it's a yeah. thing. And his background, it does fit with it, you know, and and I think he's funny and charismatic. And, yeah. you know, his his, uh, you know, most quotable line, which is very misogynistic, is actually a Joel Bagels quote. Mm-hmm. Um, that women are the rake. rake in the game of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. In the poker game of life. I just say humans are the rake. That's my adaptation. I think it's a better way to put it. Cuts you know. out the misogyny. And yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Like... It's just, just a, a misanthropy <laughs> instead. Yeah, straight. Just... <laughs> just hate them all. You don't care yeah. about gender. <laughs> I don't only want to criticize any one gender. It's really, it's just all the humans collectively. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, yeah. Um, let's talk about Joe. And... <sighs> You have her listed under characters, but... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are you saying she's a little bit two-dimensional? Uh, I'm saying, like, when I saw the poster that you you put up, sharing, uh-huh. you know, for this thing, after I spent two days failing to make the poster for the thing, <laughs> I was like, wow, she's on the poster. <laughs> it's like, why is she on the poster? <laughs> like, she, she is the the quintessential, like, the trope, like, wet blanket wife. You know, yeah. where it's like, I mean, talk, like talking about like thankless female roles, like she basically is there just to like pose a barrier to like Mike getting back into poker. 
But right. maybe you have more to, to say about her. Yeah, I actually I think I saw it that way originally. I think rewatching it tonight, as well as like thinking about it the last year or so, I've seen it differently. And that I, I like one of the things I have come to realize about myself is I don't need to play poker for a living. I don't need to play magic. I do community organizing. But like, there's a way of living that most people do of going to an office. Not not most, but an awful lot of people yeah, going to an office nine to five. You know. Coming home and, and like you know going to parties with small talk and like doing the things that like an average person of my like social background or whatever is supposed to do that just doesn't work for me. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like I think the party sound like even more of a nightmare than the office. <laughs> I mean, yes, in some ways, definitely so. Certainly, the like like I love a good cigar, but that cigar bar scene sounds oh, like goodness. absolute hell to me. Oh. Um, and I feel like she's. I mean, first of all, I feel like like her going through his genes in the early scene where she like thinks he has lied to her that she was out gambling and he's going through to find money to prove that he was gambling, which she does. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's easy to see that as she's the wet blanket true. And, and I, I wish they had given her more of a character because you're right. They write her very two dimensionally. But I think like to me, I think she does absolutely the right thing in breaking up with him, just literally ghosting him, leaving him. And I think Mike Mikey ends the movie thinking that as well. And I'm very glad. Again, the Hollywood thing would have been he comes back to her with enough money to buy her the ring she always wanted. And now she forgives him. And they <laughs> go off to Vegas together. And I'm so glad they didn't do that. I'm so glad that in some ways she was a part of the kind of normal life he was trying to lead. And like the way she treats him afterwards, to me, it isn't with animosity. It isn't, you lied to me, I hate you. It's you're never going to be a part of the kind of life I want to lead. And so I'm, as you taught me, folding a bad hand. Right. Yeah, I actually think the end is great. I think Mm -hmm. their conversation at the end where she's like, you know, call me if you're ever in town and need a lawyer, (laughs) basically, you know. And it's like it – I do feel like – um. You know, I mean, like, going through someone's stuff isn't great. Um, you know, being right about your suspicions does, you know, is is vindicating to some regard, yeah. right? They clearly weren't right for each other, at least yeah. at that point in their lives, right? And um, I, I think that that... Um, I think it makes sense, you know, and yeah. I, I just feel like, yeah, the character, it, it's just that out of all of the writing in the movie, I feel like her character is the most like sort of um, by numbers, you know? Yeah. And then, and like, it's not her performance, right? It's not Gretchen Maul. I, I don't think it's her yeah. fault. Um, I, I just think the writers like, you know, they didn't, they they wrote their Smurfette and then I guess they have Sasset also, you know, because they I, I were say, two females. I don't think she's the worst written character. I think the worst written character, unfortunately, is the other woman character who's even more two-dimensional. Yeah. But yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I agree, but like definitely mm-hmm. still not, a developed character, you know, yeah. that, and and that's like maybe if you made it an extra fifteen minutes, you could have you know put more in with those characters. Mm-hmm. You know, I, yeah. I do feel like uh, you know, I mean, they're they're both not super developed, you know, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, but but yeah, it it, it uh, yeah, it, that's just. Mm-hmm. But the the way it ends does make it feel kind of okay. Like it doesn't bother me a lot but just that whole kind of the whole law school thing outside Mm -hmm. of mike's relationship to petrovsky and you know their conversations outside of that like it just it feels like they just wanted to have something some sort of like placeholder for a normal life or whatever to then have him pivot away from right to have that sort of character Mm -hmm. turn which to me i'm like you could have just not built the movie that way you know yeah um so so that's not my my favorite uh but it does give us you know the judge's game Mm -hmm. and it does give us the you know the the scene in the bar where he's talking about you got to think about it like a war professor and Mm -hmm. you know it gives us the whole mitzvah scene too so i think it's worth it for that and so let's talk about the mitzvah and the petrovsky character who um so petrovsky is the professor who tell uh, he's the one who's kind of like he thinks Mike can be a great lawyer and then Mike is delivering something to him at this poker game for law professors and judges and DAs and Mike is able to just read the room very well and to read all the cards and impresses everybody 
but he's also the one who's kind of disappointed when Mike doesn't follow through with some of the law school stuff. Yeah. But he tells Mike this really beautiful story about how his family really wanted him to be a rabbi. And he, he studied the rabbi, he studied the mitzvah, the, he studied the midrash, he studied the Talmud, he studied the Torah, all these things, but he never found God there. And he decided he couldn't be a rabbi. And he then dedicated himself to the law. And just as an aside, his character, I think, is some of the best Jewish representation I've ever seen on screen. Because he's very clearly Jewish. They talk about him wanting to be a rabbi. He's not, like, overtly religious in any way. In fact, that's the whole point, is he's kind of non-religious. Yeah. But, like, the way he approaches things and, like, the way he approaches the law is incredibly rabbinical. I mean, it's a very similar kind of thinking. And, like, if you read parts of the Talmud, which is basically, like, rabbis discussing the Torah and, and the Jewish uh, scriptures – very much the way lawyers today discuss, like precedent and the Constitution and stuff like that, and just and the way he tells the story goes is that his family could never forgive forgive him for the most part for be could not becoming a rabbi because everyone in his family had been a rabbi, every man for like generations and generations back to the old country, and um, that he but what he realized is that he couldn't do it, and and Mike at one point asks him, Mikey asks him like, would you do all that? This, would you still make that choice if you knew your family was never going to be okay with it? And he says, what choice? Which is such a beautiful way of sort of, he's sort of understanding Mike. And I, I think he kind of later feels like, I hope I didn't tell you to drop out of law school. Right, right, right. But, and, he, and he kind of did. But he really helps to, to confront from, he really helps Mikey confront the idea of like, who are you really? And is that a law student or is it a poker player or is it somebody else? Yeah, uh, I was I was gonna bring up the the like Jewish representation. I don't think I was gonna do as well as as you just did, but like it it really I was thinking about it and like after you know we were talking about Moon Knight and and talking about mm-hmm. you know some other shows and like how you know it, how there really is this like dearth of like real like Jewish representation in in American fiction, right? Which right. seems weird, particularly because of how much American fiction is written by Jewish people, but right. like. It does feel like that. Like that. That's the most powerful part of the movie. Like I actually feel like somewhat choked up. I didn't even rewatch the movie, but I can yeah. picture every one of these scenes. You know, and he talks about his mother letting letting him go. I think right, and being that like, like that was yeah. a mitzvah, right? And right, and like that's why he gives Mike the the ten grand because he's like, let me do this for you. You know, right? And he says he Mike says, has come to him say. Yeah, Mike has come to him saying, I'm in debt. Yeah. And so he, he asks his – I mean, yeah. think of asking your law professor to loan you $10,000. Right. Like, it's a crazy thing. But the guy basically – I mean, he says he can't give fifteen, but he's willing to give ten. And like, yeah. as Paul just said, he's, he, he says how his mother forgave him and that that was a mitzvah, which is a, a Jewish wording, word for blessing for a, or a sacred thing. It's why a, a bar mitzvah is a your first mm. mitzvah. It's the first, like, sacred thing a young person does. And like you said, he she, he then says for that I owe, and it was just it's a, it's incredible, it's an incredibly beautiful, but also a very Jewish understanding of that kind of thing. And I just, yeah, I, I get I get choked up thinking yeah. about it as well. Yeah, and and it it you know that's the sort of thing that like to do to, like, I feel like it, you could have had something like that with like you know either of the female characters could have had some moment right. that felt like meaningful in some way right. and at the end i feel like that that does happen a little bit with joe you know yeah. a little bit yeah she does she basically does give him a like i'm okay with what you're doing yeah we're okay with each other we're yeah. not going to be what we were yeah i left because i had to leave it was the right thing to do you go do you i understand i'm going to do my life you know right and, and we'll, that's it um, and and because he sees her to give the money to to um, Petrovsky, Petrovsky, right? Because he yeah. just wants to hop right in the cab, catch a plane to to Vegas. Um, hopefully, it was not in the summer because it is a hundred and eleven today <laughs> in Las Vegas. You know, I didn't yeah. really think about that then, uh, but yeah. Yeah, in another mo- version of this movie, I would have wanted him to get some sleep. I would have wanted him to maybe go to a hospital to see, like, about all those bruises he has. But, like, right, right, right. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. He probably yeah. This is pre-Obamacare. He probably can't afford it. Yeah. And, like, just for a point of note, like, um, yeah, killing someone who owes you money is a bad way to collect. Breaking someone's legs who owes you money, that's, like, that's a time-honored tradition. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that probably would have more realistically been the actual... Um, you know, thing. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Blab Zabs also wrote, it's uh, Zutica. I, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but uh, he's following Jewish law. I, I think what you mean is um, Petrovsky is in yeah. terms of like the, is the paying it forward. But uh, Blabby Abby, if you want to write uh, more to explain that, I would love to hear that because uh, I know you know that stuff a lot better than I do. Um, so yeah, I will definitely keep you informed as that, that comes along. Cool. Um, and what about like one of the things I think really makes this movie, as I said, is and it's kind of funny. It was it was a small indie movie. Ed Norton was definitely a big name already. Like Matt Damon was starting to become a big name. John Turturro, John Malkovich, and Martin Landau are all very big name actors, and they yeah. all have a part in this. And th- those three sort of older men who are all, to some extent, like either mentors or like older figures who Mike wants to challenge yeah. are just such an important part of this movie. Uh, what do you think of KGB as a character? Like, he is very much a kind of, like, he's the stereotypical, like, mobster villain who just has yeah. a lot of great lines. I don't know if there's any great moral capacity in that character, but... I mean, I think the character's fantastic. <laughs> like, so first of all, there's some YouTube video with Matt Damon talking about the first time Malkovich came in, and, uh-huh. you know, and, like, Apparently, he was doing that accent at, like, a 15, you know, uh-huh. on a scale of 1 to 10. And everyone was like, oh, yeah. And, and Malkovich leans in and he's like, I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> <laughs> he's cracked up and, like, he's like, should I dial it back a bit? And Matt Damon's like, yeah, maybe, maybe just maybe just it down a little bit. Yeah. And he's like, is this guy serious? <laughs> is he really, is this, you? He's <laughs> like, oh my goodness! Oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? But like, but that's the thing is, like, I mean, in the movie, the accent is pretty over the top, but that's part of why it's. I mean, it does sound like people I've met. Yeah, yeah. But it's, so, but it's also so quotable because of that. It's why, like, when we try to quote it, we'll always try to fake the accent in yeah, some way. Cause yeah, always, always. It. Yeah, no. It. I mean, so. Uh, so there's some like substance to the character that I really appreciate, mm-hmm. which is that. You know, yes, he's this mobster. Yes, he he runs this poker club. You know, he plays with the, you know, at the highest stakes. And he's apparently very good. And he, at the end, when grandma's like, come on, take it. You know, he's like, no, he beat me. He beats me straight up, you know. And mm-hmm. it's like, he has some respect for Mike winning yeah. and outplaying him, right? He respects yeah. it. He's angry about it. But he respects it. And the reason he has such like a, a hard on for Worm, I'd say, is that he knows Worm's a cheater. And mm-hmm. he doesn't respect that. And so yeah. I think he has this kind of sense of honor and this sense of fairness. And like, you know, he does whatever his you know, his his organized crime stuff is, but like this he he the game matters to him, the game, you know. Yeah. And and so I, I, I really appreciate that about the character. I will say that, you know, we we had a, a, a friend from Russia around that time who who I talked to about it and was like, yeah, actually, you know, that's kind of a, you know, a sort of an accent that might be kind of like outside Moscow area kind of you know mm-hmm. um and he was like kind of explaining me the difference between like sort of saint petersburg and moscow accent and how this was kind of i don't know if it was like more of like the burbs or like uh-huh. kind of more of like an industrial type uh, area or whatever but like that he was like yeah this does actually feel like a legit um russian accent of like a particular right. area and i know when around when we were talking about covering this movie at, at one point um you know it was after the the russian invasion of ukraine and and um, you know, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about sort of like Russophobia in movies and and kind of like, you know, all these like Russian villains and, and this, right. you know, obviously, you know, I mean, obviously, like, you know, you can say like, yes, the, the, the Russian military is doing a horrible thing right now. Right. Mm-hmm. But like that doesn't mean that like you should look down on like people of Russian descent. You know, right. it's like that doesn't make it OK to then just be like, oh. You know, I mean, the way like there's a lot of like anti-German sentiment still, you know, yeah. that that like, is there's a, understandable, but also the, not, you know, there's that great line in the Captain America movie, the first one that the first nation mm-hmm. that Hitler conquered was Germany. Right. Exactly. And I think you can say the same thing. Like the first the first nation that Putin conquered was Russia. Yeah. And like the people, yeah. it's basically a it's a very fascist government. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I definitely think you're right. And this is a whole other discussion. But like. You know, for an awfully long time, uh, if you wanted to show mobsters in movies, first it was Italians. Right. But then, like, as we kind of got past the Godfather era, like, that didn't make as much sense anymore because 
most of the Michael Corleones had gotten out and gone respectable, or many of them weren't there to begin with. But like now Hollywood started showing you movies where if it was about a gang movie or like mobsters, it was always black and Latino. Right. And there was often a lot of racism in that. And so, like, a way, I, like I, I've never heard anyone, like, do a full analysis of this. This might just be my pet theory. But I kind of think that, like, about the time – that about the time people started to point out how racist it was to only show black and uh, Latino people in, uh, in those kind of roles, that – awareness of the Russian mob also was starting to grow. And so Russia was like this perfect, oh no, they're white guys, right. but like they're mobsters and so we can make it happen. And Right, yeah, and, and it's I, like there's no more using the Russians as like the Cold War enemies so now, right. you know. But like in poker in New York City, yeah, the Russian immigrants, especially on like the Coney Island, Brighton Beach area, like that was a very strong thing. And I certainly met like I would say that other people I played with poker in New York City like, the foreign accent I heard the most was Russian. In casinos, I'm, I'm nothing like that. I'm scanning my, my, my recollections. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely very present, for sure. Yeah. 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 But yeah, I, I agree. I think he's, like, to me, I more mean, like, he's not a character, like, to explore his morality very much, except for the point I think you made of that, like, he does, he does treat poker straight up. You know, I think in some ways, yeah. the games at his club are the most honest games of poker we see in the movie. Right. Mostly because yeah, Worm's yeah. not playing there, but also I think he would never tolerate someone like Worm for a second. Right, exactly. That, that, wouldn't, <laughs> that wouldn't go over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just sure. to back up on the Martin Landau thing, Petrovsky for a second, uh, Blabs Abs wrote, uh, uh, she, she, she uh, mentions a Hebrew word, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing, but Zedeka, uh, and she writes, it's a mitzvah slash moral obligation to give. Lots of Jewish communities have some level of 1% of income they're supposed to give, generally within the community. To me, that's what the professor was doing. He saw Mike making the choice and saw his community, and seeing someone in his community in need, he had a religious and moral obligation to give. Yeah, I think, cool. that, I think that's a really good way of describing it. And, and of, like in Judaism, is, there's all these debates back and forth, and I've talked about this myself as someone who's not religiously Jewish, but is culturally and like heritage-wise Jewish. And yeah, that kind of thing where it's like even someone like Petrovsky who doesn't believe in God necessarily, I mean, that's why he says he doesn't become a rabbi, he's still very Jewish and he holds those Jewish obligations. And yeah, so I can very much see that he would see it as a mitzvah, he would see it as an obligation, he would see it as what he is supposed to do is to help someone like Mike in the same way that people helped him. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Thank you for the, the clarification on that, Blabs Abs. Yeah. Definitely, and, uh, definitely. And I mean, I, would you say it's fair to say that he's like culturally Jewish, if not religiously Jewish? Oh, yeah. Very much okay. so. Very much so. And, and and even maybe, I mean, like, I mean, that's the thing is like Jewish a- atheists and Jewish agnostics are very much a part of Judaism, you know? And right. that, like in Judaism, you're encouraged to question things and to to question God and, right. and, and to question every, everybody else. And so, yeah, I think he's... You could say that he's spiritual. I mean, it may well be that like 30 years later, he started going to shul again. Like, who knows? But ethnically Jewish, yeah, is what Labs Abs writes in. I think that that's definitely true. Yeah. Um, So let's talk about the last of the big um, mentor characters, Kanish. Uh, As you said, based on someone we knew, uh, Joe Bagels. Joel Bagels. Um, What what do you think of Kanish and his role in the movie? I mean, he's just, it's just, he's just so good. Like, you know, it... (laughs) Although I think he thinks every every problem can be solved with a cup of coffee. Ah, come on, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> Everything will be fine. Um, you know, he feels he feels a lot more like uh, like bagels than yeah. KGB. He feels like KGB for sure. You know, I mean, he's mm-hmm. he's definitely um, seriously based on him. Um, you know, the real Joel Bagels, was hilarious dude. Um, very funny, uh, you know, organized kind of like the, the high-low games and got them mm-hmm. going. Um, and actually the writers of this screenplay of Rounders um, wrote a nice um, obituary, or, or whether it was an obituary or like a, a column about him mm-hmm. after he died. He, he was kind of young, I think it was in his 50s when he died, um, like in the last 10 years. But um yeah, he is like your like vintage like old school grinder like mm-hmm. you know I'm gonna basically play you know tight is right uh, you know you play aggressively when you get something but you know you mostly keep your head down and you don't take too many risks and you know that's a, it's a style that could just print money back in the day you know yeah and I think in good 
live games, like not online, but like in person, like you can still make money playing that way, not taking a bunch of risks. Like, you know, you can go to your local 1-3 game. You can probably spend a couple of hours of learning some real fundamentals, and then you can just pay a lot of attention and have a lot of discipline, and you can yeah. probably just make money in that game. You know, you need a bankroll, yeah. but if you play the way Kanish plays, you don't need as big a bankroll, right? The more right. kind of flamboyantly, the more shots you take, often you'll need a, a bigger, you know, a bigger bankroll. Right. And he's not getting that rush that often when he hits the miracle card that he probably shouldn't have hit because he's not taking those chances as much. Or if he is, yeah, he's, he's not getting he's not getting a rush out of it. It's like, cool, I lost 48 other times, but I hit because I'm getting paid more than 50 to 1. So it works. Yeah, yeah. which like 50 to 1 is, is not those numbers are a, little... a thing. But, but I did the other day, I had a tweet about this. I did have someone fold for two cents in a pot that was $147. Meaning they were getting seventy three hundred and fifty one to one after I bet my two cents, and they folded. And uh, if everybody was that good at keeping their two cents to themselves, then Twitter wouldn't exist. I but, appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. that. But yeah, it was uh, you know you don't usually get odds like that. Yeah. But yeah, I, exactly. I sh- he's he's not in there taking the big risk, and he might even fold getting fifty to one on a forty eight to one shot. He's like, eh, it's not worth it. You know, right. you don't go for the thin edges. You go for the fat value. You know, you're like, I know my mm-hmm. hand's the best. I'm going to value bet, value bet, value bet, you know, stuff like that. Um, and, yeah, that's like a kind of like an old school way of playing, you know. And there's still yeah. people who play that way. And a lot of them still make money. And mm-hmm. a bunch of, you know, players who, who play a more aggressive, modern style have a lot of contempt for players like that. Um, but, like, those players still make money. In most games. Yeah. There's players who... I mean, a player actually like Kanish is still going to make money. There's people who play like that, but without any imagination and without actual understanding of really what's going on in the game. You know, I feel right. like Kanish actually does really know what's going on in the games. He knows all the games in the city. You know, he knows which games are going to be profitable and which is the soft mm-hmm. game. And he's going <clears> to <throat> play in it. And he's going to make his, you know, one big bet an hour, which, you know, back in the day of limit games, you play 10 20. That means the bet sizes are $10 and 20 dollars you make twenty dollars an hour and you know you're happy with that um whereas you know mike's trying to to learn a, a more comprehensive style although they don't see him bluffing they don't show him bluffing very much at all you know yeah so there's really not a lot of mike bluffing he's he basically plays like kanish he just right. he just goes and plays in some bigger games he, he bluffs once in their hand against johnny chan Oh, where yeah, he's like yeah, kind of yeah. oddly aggressive to this guy who just sat down to play poker. The whole like, I don't know, John. It's right. very funny to me where it's okay. like. I got to tell my, gotta... my Johnny Chan story. So in it. 2010, I played in the World Series of Poker main event. And um, I did end up cashing, which was very fun. But like mm-hmm. I came in like 649th out of like. 8,000 or something ridiculous, right. uh, which was good for, you know, a decent payday. But I, you know, you get breaks every every couple hours. And one of the breaks, you know, I, I you know, I go wherever I go. I'm coming back. And this guy walks alongside me and says, do you know what time it is? And I look at him and it's Johnny Chan. And like, it took so much willpower not to say, <laughs> I'm sorry, John, I don't remember. <laughs> And I just imagine how many times people have said that to him and how sick he must be of hearing that. Um, but I did. I just I just told him what time it was. And then we went back and we both played. So that was that's my Johnny that was Chan story. That was my Johnny Chan story is managing not to be a total asshole <laughs> and I feeling good about myself. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, and so Kanish, he he supports Mikey through a lot of the movie. Like, the first time Mike loses everything, he supports him. He gets him a job driving this truck. And he's clearly like, I want to teach you. I want to help you. Yeah. But, like, they have a fight towards the end where he's like, you know, he he's upset that Mike wants to gamble and that Mike supports someone like Worm. Because I think he's 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 all, he's all very much about play it straight. Yeah. And, and, and so part of what that means is, like... You don't cheat at the game ever, but you also don't get involved with someone like Worm because that's a right. bad gamble. Which yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it is. It's, it's yeah. a loyalty thing. Yeah. And one of the pivotal parts of the movie, this guy who seems so much like a mentor and a support to Mike, when Mike just needs any kind of like his literal life, either as like bullet in the head or as you said, maybe like twenty years of working for Eddie KGB is on the line. Kanish can't loan him anywhere near the fifteen thousand. He could loan him maybe two thousand or a thousand. Yeah. But he won't do it. Right. Uh, what do you think of his decision there? Like, is he just being disloyal and terrible? Like, is he doing the right thing to cut Mikey off then? I mean, 
I think he's like, I can't give you enough that it's going to make a difference to you. So I'm not going to just like throw it away, you know? Yeah. And I, I feel like it makes sense. Like, you know, it would be nice if he tried to help him more. But, you right. know, he already he tried to help him in his own way. Right. And right. then Mike was just like, no, I'm going to do this other thing and I'm going to get involved with Worm. And Kanish is like, I told you not to, you know, like yeah. I gave you my help when it might have helped. You know, and now it's too late. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and and so I I I think like the idea that like, you know, whether he could have scrounged up ten or fifteen k, I don't know. Um, right. But he is basically like, you know, he's like, I'll stake you, I'll you know, I'll mm -hmm. I'll help you get off your, you know, get get back on your feet. But like, I I can't help you now. Like basically, you 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 host yourself too bad. You know, right. and it's so whether it's like unwillingness or just he's like unable, like he's like, I can't give you enough help that it's worth anything. So a right. little bit of help isn't I'm not going to, you know, just yeah. throw something away. Yeah, I, th I think that's definitely a big part of it. I also think there's some level of like he doesn't know the change that Mike has gone through, I think, understandably. And I think he like. I think he kind of sees what he's doing to Mike is what Mike did to Worm. Like on some, like in his mind, it, it feels like he thinks like this is enabling you. Like if right. you're gonna try one more time to to take two thousand dollars into fifteen thousand in a night, like that's not what I want to support you doing. Right, right. Um, and I, I, you know, it's it's funny. Then Mike then has to turn to someone who doesn't know that side of him, yeah. uh, and get much more from it. But I, I think you could have treated that in a way where Kanish is one of the antagonists and mm, Kanish is yeah. someone else who's like holding Mikey back. Right. And I don't think they do that. I think they portray it as like, no, he's just, Mike has hit a point where he's willing to take risks that this guy can't support. And yeah. so he cuts them off. Yeah, I think so too. I think, I think there's like a fair amount of like healthy people cutting people off in this movie, mm -hmm. but then also a fair amount of like, people really extending themselves to try and help someone out, right? Like, yeah. Mike really tries to help, um, really high, tries to help Worm, and it doesn't work out. And then he cuts him yeah. off, you know? And um, and Kanish really tries to help Mike, and it doesn't work out. And then he cuts him off. And, like, you know, Joe, like, you know, I mean, she, she tries to help Mike, I think, in yeah. the beginning, right? She's like, look, we'll just, you know, not... Like, you, you stop playing poker because obviously it's not working anymore. Right. And we'll just do this law school thing and everything will be fine, you know. And and then, like, he, he lapses back into it and she's like, this isn't going to work, you know. And she cuts yeah. him off. And then, you know, the, the judge, basically, Petrovsky, like, is the one who's like, I, I'm really going to, you know, go kind of above and beyond to, to help right. you. You know, even though... Um, I don't know whether he's the one who cut him off in terms of the, the law school, but he was like, look, Mike, you can't, you know, this isn't kind of, you know. Right. Um, yeah, that's why I really love the point that uh, Blab Zabs brought up of Zedekah, the like kind of uh, the, that, that, the, the, the religious part of it, or at least the, ethnic, the Jewish part of it, of the, the obligation Petrovsky has there. Yeah. Um, so I think that covers most of the things in the movie that I wanted to hit. Uh, we could go much longer, but we're already approaching our longest podcast. We're not right? quite yeah, into yeah, the two-hour yeah. two hour area. Yeah. We've got about 12 minutes left. Yeah. Um, any of the last things about the movie you wanted to bring up or about just poker in general and the ethics of it? Um, no, I think I think we covered um, – I mean, there's I, I mean, I could have a podcast that's just about poker, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think we covered what I would like to say about this movie in this podcast today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I, and I'm really glad we got to do it. I'm glad also we we didn't spend too much time on it, but we got to talk a little bit about like the the poker mindset of like you said of seeing things probabilistically because I think that's something that in everything from like not understanding how polls work and thus how elections work to the kind of choices people make in their life or anything like that. Like, this is not something the movie explores, but something I've explored quite a lot is the the linkage between mental illness and the way you see probability. Hmm. Because I think as someone who's been through like very big, bad depression in a lot of ways, but also read like a lot of texts about this, the human mind, like what's great about the human mind is that we can see patterns. Like right. we, that's what makes us who we are. We can see things like the Oreo thing. But because of how good we are at that, we want to find patterns even when they're not there. And especially when we're having cognitive dissonance of some kind, often due to depression or anxiety or something like that. And so like the number of times I would be 
when I played a lot in California when I was in grad school studying to be a pastor, and people knew that I was studying to be a pastor. And so every now and then, someone, like, maybe it's happened like three different times, someone would pull me aside and be like, can we talk for a bit? I was like, they were like, why? It's like, I think God's angry at me because of the bad cards that I'm getting. Oh, yeah. And I, I wanted to say to them something like, I think God doesn't want you to draw to an inside straight, but, like, I don't think God has any problem. Like, but that's the thing is, like, you know, when you feel like the world is against you, A, you're not going to remember all the times you got the good cards. You're only going to remember the times you get the bad cards. But you're going to try and see the pattern of that. You're going to try and find some way to, instead of just understanding, like, yeah, you can be the best person. I, I had a hand where uh, I was telling um, uh, my, one of my partners, we were talking about this movie, and she asked me what was the biggest hand I ever lost. And I talked about how I lost a $1,200 pot because I had aces. I think it was maybe more than that. I had aces, and I got all the money in before the flop, did exactly what we wanted to do. And the person drew out and got a flush. Yeah. And like that, I, did I have the best hand? Yes. Should I win the majority of hands in that situation and the majority of money? If we repeat that a hundred times, yes. But that means if you're going to win sixty-five percent of the time, that means three times out of three and a half times out of every ten, you're going to lose. And yeah, just, there's all sorts of stuff there about probability and stuff that people just do not understand. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to probabilities, like, and and just and seeing patterns, there's there's so many cognitive biases, you know, that mm-hmm. um, really come into play in in poker in terms of finding patterns and making decisions and you know making decisions in an environment where there's a lot of uncertainty and you know i i i can see how you know various you know mental illnesses might might play into that even more you know yeah um but like even how somebody who has no you know nothing diagnosed as a mental illness just like a a any any human mind has a lot of these biases that we have to um, try to understand and then sort of adjust for and and figure out how to how to kind of accept about ourselves, but then mm-hmm. then be like, okay, you know, it's like if you, I mean, if you have a bias against a group of people, like. The first thing you can do is understand that and then accept it right. and then try and be like, okay, now what can I do about this? You know? Right. And I mean, that, that's the basis of so much anti-racist work because just understanding how has your whiteness affected the way you see things or like, you know, gender stuff or any of those things. Right. Exactly. And, and you know, just people are constantly looking for patterns and the, some, sometimes there's not a pattern, you know, yeah. so there's, there's only manufactured patterns or p- patterns that we've inferred, but there's, there's nothing that's actually truthfully implied from, from the data. Right. So. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, one pattern that there is, it, one pattern that does exist is that you continue to put out content. So mm. for those people who enjoy the content you've been putting out or are hearing you on this and want to learn more, where can they find your content? Right. So you can find um, <laughs> my content um, I have three YouTube channels, Zen Madman, Zen Madman Poker, and Zad, Zen Madman Chess. I think it's fairly explanatory what content you'll find on at least the latter two. Um, you'll find things like this podcast and, and maybe some other stuff on, on the just plain Zen Madman. Um, I have my website, zenmadman.com, that I am going to start actually writing stuff on daily. Um, and then, you know, I'm on Twitter and Twitch as Zen Madman. And in terms of the name Zen Madman, I, um, I have a new challenge that I am uh-huh. issuing to myself that wherein I believe I will truly earn the moniker. Um, okay. Where my plan over the next... 80 months, roughly 2,000 days, is to spend 10,000 hours um, training and studying uh, poker, and then another 10,000 hours training and studying other things, including chess, music, writing, and languages, the languages including Spanish, uh, German, Italian, and then three different Chineses, uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Toysonese. So, you know, just a little, just a little thing I'm doing. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I get that you're into the short term goals right now. I would yeah. encourage you to look even longer, but you know, yeah, I, I guess mean, a I little guess less than a decade, you know, 800, uh, 800, mo- 80 months. You said it was 80 months. Yeah. 5.33 okay. uh, three years, roughly. So I like it. Yeah. I like it. Oh okay. no. 5.67 well, years. Sorry. That's yeah. 
Um, I have a little bit of a shorter term plan, but nice. I know that Andor is coming out pretty soon, and we're going to cover that on the Star Wars Universe podcast. We're going to keep coming out with great episodes, I hope, here on the Superhero Ethics podcast, although probabilistic, probabilistically, sometimes something will go wrong. We recorded a great episode that got eaten by the computer gods. That'll happen sometimes. Bad beat. You just got to roll with it. Uh, but yeah, please check out those uh, the other podcasts I do, and most importantly, give us your feedback. Um, this episode, one of the best comments I think, a- that anyone made was what came to us from the chat from Blab abs um we love that we love content we get from emails uh tweets uh facebook messages whatever it is you can find all the ways to contact us you can find all the ways to contact us by going to superheroethics.com there you'll find all these kind of co- ways to contact us as well as all the other podcasts we're doing uh, i think we are now able to really commit that we're going to be doing these uh live stream of podcasts on 7 30 central time 5 30 central time uh 5 30 pacific uh, 5.30 Pacific Time, 7.30 Central Time, 8.30 Eastern Time on twitch.tv slash zenmadman. Um, next week, we'll be talking about uh, AI. We'll be getting uh, Rob McKenzie back, as well as my father-in-law, Dan McCreary. Uh, Dan McCreary, being a professional in AI, he's the one who told me that the, the robots in Matrix got a bad deal and explained to me why we should be happy about our new robot overlords. Uh, we'll be discussing the movie War Games from 1982 with Matthew Broderick. Great, great I'm on, movie. I'm on his team for this one. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I think you, you do really get along. Um, yeah, so definitely check all that out. Go to our website. Check out all the great things Paul is doing. Thank you so much to all of you for listening. Thank you for those of you who wrote in comments. They really added to this episode so much. Thank you to everybody involved. And most importantly, as fans, be good to each other. <laughs>